said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. Reply to him, Friend, who appointed me as your judge and arbitrator? Then he said to the crowd, Take care to guard against all greed, for though one may be rich, one's life does not consist of possessions. Then he told them a parable. There was a rich man whose land produced a bountiful harvest. He asked himself, What shall I do? For I did not have space to store my harvest. And he said, This is what I shall do. I shall tear down my barns and build larger ones. There I shall store all my grain and other goods. And I shall say to myself, Now is for you. You have so many good things stored up for many years. Rest, eat, drink, be merry. God said to him, You fool. This night your life will be demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, to whom will they belong? Thus will it be for the one who stores up treasure for himself, but is not rich in what matters to God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. So this week at Daily Mass, we are going to be reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. This is the, uh, this is the longest epistle that St. Paul wrote, uh, unless you include Hebrews in that, maybe that's comparable in size, but uh, this is the first of Paul's letters that is listed in the New Testament. So for many people, uh, if they're thinking about the theology of St. Paul, this kind of becomes the foundational book of the Bible that we look to. St. Paul's letter to the Romans is also a very common book that comes up in conversations between Catholics and Protestants. Uh, some people have invented or called something called the Romans Road. So basically here in the United States when uh, certain evangelicals or, or Baptist people, when they try to convert Catholics, they basically show them different passages in the letter to the Romans like about how all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so they talk to the Catholic and say that obviously Mary was not conceived without sin because all have fallen short. And so they use things like that. And then they use other passages in the book of Romans where it talks about the emphasis of faith over works. That we are justified and saved by faith rather than by works. So Romans is very much a favorite book of many Protestants. And it's been that way ever since the days of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther had a great love for this letter to the Romans. Uh, as you know, Martin Luther, he was, a, he was a Catholic priest before he started the Protestant Reformation. He was a, a scripture scholar at one of the universities in Germany. And according to his own testimony, one day he was reflecting on this letter to the Romans. And he had a epiphany or a, a revelation that his whole life he had been immensely he had been immensely scrupulous and very sinful and he always was in despair of his salvation of his standing with god and it was through his reflecting on the letter to the romans that he realized he would never be justified by his works by his conduct but rather he was only saved by the grace of god and this was kind of the watershed moment for Martin Luther, according to his own testimony. And ever since then, scripture scholarship, even, has been dominated by this idea that when many Protestant scholars read the book of Romans, that's how they read it. They read it the same way that Martin Luther did. Now, it's kind of interesting in our own day, at least in the West, and this is something that I, I find interesting and pay attention to. 
But many Protestant scholars are beginning to abandon that view of St. Paul's letter to the Romans. They're realizing that for centuries, rather than reading St. Paul's letter on its own terms, they are reading it through that same lens of Luther. And they are beginning to abandon it. This is called the, the new perspective on Paul. Right? You can find information about that if you're interested in learning more. But uh, the most advanced scholars, the most recent scholarship, they're all seeming to abandon that view. Now, on the other side of things, you also have uh, some Catholics, I would say, in particular, who have also allowed this letter to be Lutheranized. And that's why oftentimes in ecumenical dialogue, you'll hear about the debate between faith and works. And of course, Protestants are on the faith side and Catholics are on the work side. It's important that we don't fall into that trap either. The fact that we are saved by works, that was condemned as a heresy all the way back in the fourth century. It's called the heresy of Pelagianism. As Catholics, we don't believe that we're saved by faith or by works. We believe that we're saved by the grace of God, and then we cooperate with that grace by means of our faith and our works. It's actually basically the same, same opinion that most Protestant scholars are beginning to come to. They call it covenant nominalism. And that's a big scholarly jargon, which basically means that through the grace of God, we are brought into relationship with Him by means of the new covenant, by means of baptism and our entry into the church. And we call that the gift of faith. Faith is not simply uh, our, our assent, like our mental assent to belief in God. Faith is a relationship with God. We enter in through the sacrament of baptism. We enter in to the new covenant people of God. But we can take ourselves out of the covenant by abandoning that faith of God or by committing evil works and deeds. And so we as Catholics sometimes we can fall into that same trap. It's not so much about us needing to be good people or perfect people without sin. It's about us maintaining relationship with God. That's what matters most. That's why being excommunicated or apostatizing from the church is so serious. Because that means we take ourselves out of relationship with God. We remove ourselves from the new covenant people. And so as we continue to read through this letter to the Romans throughout this week, I imagine we will see more of these things come to light.